Welcome back to Structures Unchained, your weekly deep dive into the world's most ambitious mega projects. It's 8.17 a.m. and a train is crawling into Houston like it's approaching a red light it can't see. And right now, London is trying to do something almost unfair, rebuild its rail heart like a machine while it's still running at full load. So can this be done? Let's break it down. Euston is where London's rail geometry turns into pressure. It's a terminus, which means trains don't flow through and disappear. They arrive, unload, reverse the logic of the platform, and launch again. That makes capacity feel like a ceiling you can hit in real time, especially when anything goes wrong. HS2 was supposed to be the clean release valve, a new high-speed station, new approaches, a rebuilt campus, and a future where the West Coast Corridor has room to breathe. But as of January 2026, Houston is still the most complicated sentence in the whole program. Because the question isn't, do we want it? The question is, who builds it? How is it funded? And what gets built first? The government's direction has shifted toward a public-private partnership model, with a dedicated Houston delivery company expected to lead on design. HS2's role stays critical, but more behind the curtain, enabling works, interfaces, and the approach infrastructure that has to align perfectly with whatever the final station solution becomes. And here's the brutal truth about mega projects: Uncertainty doesn't sit quietly at the top of the org chart. It bleeds into engineering. If the end state footprint changes, the approach structures change. If the approach structures change, your construction sequence changes. And when the sequence changes, the schedule stops being a schedule and becomes a negotiation with physics. This is why Houston feels like a countdown with no visible clock. It isn't just a station, it's an entire campus puzzle. And the danger isn't that Euston doesn't happen. The danger is that London builds the next decade of rail capacity in a way that arrives near the center instead of into it. Which is why the system needed a second anchor. A station designed to take weight before Euston is finished. That anchor is already rising. If Euston's sequence stays unstable, the network can't plan around it. And London risks getting a high-speed railway with a compromised landing. Oldo Common is being built with one obsession, throughput. Not glamour, not heritage. When it's complete, it's planned as one of the best connected interchanges Britain has ever built. HS2 platforms below, conventional rail above, and a direct tie-in to the Elizabeth line that turns West London into a distribution engine. The stats tell you what kind of station this is supposed to be. 14 platforms in total, six for HS2, eight for existing national rail services, a daily passenger target in the hundreds of thousands, a location that can put you about 10 minutes from the West End and around 20 from the city, without the traditional funnel everyone into zone one and pray logic. And as of January 2026, Old Oak isn't a concept anymore, it's mass. The station box excavation has been completed to around 20 meters deep and construction has moved into the next phase, building out the six high-speed platforms inside that underground shell. This is the point where a mega project stops being works in progress and starts becoming permanent geometry. Old Oak is also the strategic pivot if Houston slips. Because even if the final terminus isn't ready, Old Oak can still function as the place where HS2 services begin interacting with London at scale, feeding straight into the Elizabeth line and spreading passengers across the city before they ever reach the traditional choke points. Which means Old Oak isn't a backup plan. It's the pressure valve that lets the machine keep running while the hardest piece gets untangled. But there's a catch. A hub is only as powerful as the conveyor belt it connects to. So the real secret weapon in this entire rebuild isn't a high-speed platform. It's the line that turns interchange into capacity. Old Oak is how London buys time, creating a working super interchange that can carry demand even while the terminus remains unresolved. The Elizabeth line is what makes the machine metaphor real. Because London doesn't have a capacity problem that speed can fix. London has a distribution problem. The city isn't short on destinations. It's short on ways to move huge numbers through the center without everything compressing into the same handful of stations. By early 2025, 
The Elizabeth line had already passed the 500 million journeys mark in roughly two and a half years. That's not a novelty line, that's an artery. And Old Oak Common is designed to plug directly into it. That changes the map of London in a way most people only feel after they use it. Places that used to be far become single station decisions. Interchanges become faster than taxis. Misconnections become less catastrophic because the headways and options are better. This is why Old Oak matters beyond HS2 branding. If you can take passengers off a national rail platform and push them east or west through London quickly, you turn a terminus problem into a network solution. You stop treating Zone 1 like a bucket that fills until it spills. You treat London like a system with multiple exits. But that only works if the system is reliable under pressure. And pressure doesn't come from one big day. It comes from repeated disruption, engineering works, weekend possessions, signal failures, and the slow grind of rebuilding a live city. Which brings us to the part of this story that determines whether London's rebuild feels inevitable or fragile. The order. The Elizabeth line is the distribution engine that makes new hubs useful. Without it, Old Oak is just a big station. With it, Old Oak becomes a network release valve. Mega projects don't collapse because nobody can build. They collapse because somebody builds the right thing at the wrong time. By 2025, HS2 leadership was openly describing a reset built around sequencing, working backwards from the opening date, aligning suppliers, and forcing the program to stop doing work out of order that creates expensive rework later. That language might sound corporate, but the implication is physical. You can't finish stations before you've locked the interfaces. You can't accelerate tunneling if the approach strategy is still shifting. You can't promise capacity relief if you haven't protected time for testing, commissioning, and the boring reliability work that prevents the first year from becoming a public disaster. And London is the worst place in the country to get that wrong. Because London doesn't give you the luxury of a quiet opening. Everything launches under load. That's what makes the Euston question so dangerous. Not because it's embarrassing, because it infects the logic of the whole sequence. Every uncertainty at the terminus pushes stress into the parts behind it. Interfaces, schedules, possession planning, and the credibility of dates. So London's strategy became clear in late 2025. Push Old Oak forward as a functioning interchange anchor. Keep the enabling and approach works moving where possible, and rebuild the Euston delivery plan in a way that doesn't sabotage everything else. But the public won't judge the reset by whether it sounds organized. They'll judge it by what it feels like on a random Tuesday morning. And that brings us to the most underrated part of rebuilding London like a machine, the knock-on effects. Sequencing is the hidden cliffhanger. Get the order wrong, and the project doesn't just get later, it gets harder to finish. This is why London's rebuild isn't only HS2 and two stations. It's also the invisible reliability upgrades happening across the wider network. Network Rail's big signaling modernization programs, like the South London lines into Victoria, show what this looks like in practice, replacing old 1980s era systems so reliability improves and the network can handle demand without crumbling into delays. These upgrades aren't glamorous, but they decide whether the city can keep moving while the headline megaprojects are still under construction. And this is the part that ties Euston, Old Oak, and the Elizabeth line together. If Euston is constrained, passengers shift to other routes. If passengers shift, interchange stations take the hit. The whole system needs better control, better signaling, better passenger information, and fewer failure points. This is why rebuilding like a machine is the only approach that works in London. A machine can tolerate one component being rebuilt if the rest of the system is stable enough to carry the load. That's what Old Oak is trying to do for HS2. That's what the Elizabeth line already does for central distribution. And that's what the wider reliability programs do in the background. Keep everyday London from feeling like a constant emergency while the next decade is being built. Because if London can't keep the current network calm, the public won't believe the future one. And if the public doesn't believe it, the political oxygen disappears right when the build needs it most. So the real question isn't, can London build big? It's whether London can keep the machine stable long enough to finish the rebuild. 
Euston is where everyone expects the story to end. Old Oak Common is where the story might need to function first. As it stands, the direction is visible. Euston is being restructured around a new delivery model and private finance exploration, while HS2 continues enabling and approach work where possible. At the same time, Old Oak is advancing into its physical reality. Station box complete, high-speed platforms underway, built to absorb demand and feed it into the Elizabeth Line's distribution machine. This is why London is rebuilding its rail hub like a machine. Because a machine doesn't survive on ambition, it survives on sequence, stability, and the ability to keep moving while parts are still being replaced. And in the years ahead, the defining moment won't be a ribbon cutting. It'll be a morning where London doesn't notice anything at all, because the system finally has enough capacity, enough redundancy, and enough order that awaiting clearance stops being a daily soundtrack. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.